All right, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about supercomputer architectures. Uh, my name is Charles Lively, as um, I'm a member of the user engagement group here at NURSE with Rebecca as well as Helen. Um, and so when we talk about supercomputer architectures, what do we mean? What exactly is a supercomputer? Well, in order for us to be able to do tackle some of the biggest scientific problems in the world, we have to have some of the most cutting edge technologies in order to do that. And so over time, the idea or concept of a computer as well as a supercomputer has evolved. So here we have a, a visual depiction of some of the different supercomputing types of systems over the previous decade, starting with the Cray XT1 system, IBM Blue Gene system that was noted popularly in the early 2000s, Cray XT5, uh, the Cray Shasta. And now going into the future, what will the next systems look like? Will it be quantum? Will it be FPGAs? Will it be uh, extreme scale GPUs? What will those systems look like? Well, it takes a lot of different components for us to consider what the what those systems will be. And so let's kind of break down what the what the components are in supercomputing architecture. So first you want to consider a supercomputer is basically the biggest, fastest computer at this minute. Uh, so the top 500 publishes a top 500 supercomputing. Uh, systems in the world every six months, and that changes um, based off of updates to the system. So whoever is the, the biggest and fastest supercomputer can change at any given moment. But generally, you want to think about a supercomputer as a computing system that has 100 times the compute power of your traditional laptop. So you can think about being able to solve some of the biggest, most complex molecular um, predictions in a snap of a finger versus waiting days on your laptop. So we utilize supercomputers to do all these complex, com com solve all these complex computations. And so there are different types of architectures that can be used to describe a supercomputer. And so traditionally you have a cluster architecture. This is what we have when we want to have a system that can consist of multiple computers that are networked together to share memory and share different components. We can also have a symmetric multiprocessor system. So in this case, we have a single memory of the system that can be used for communication more efficiently. And then we also have massively parallel processing systems where we have multiple processors that can do many tasks uh, in parallel quickly. So just a little bit more detail when we're talking about symmetric multiprocessors or SMP architectures. With these architectures, we have access to equal parts of memory and input and output of devices very quickly. So these means that this means that we have massive parallelism and um, a massive amount of memory that can be shared amongst the processors. Um, why might it be important for us to make sure that we have a, a large amount of memory for our processors to share, for our processors to share? Why is memory so important for us to make sure that processes have enough? And what, in what um, situations where it, would it be important that we have a lot of memory versus when we might not need a lot of memory? So when you're running um, memory intensive applications, multiple applications can cause um, memory trash. And like, essentially the working set size of the applications could, could be so large and then when you have multiple of those applications running at the same time, they could basically cause all the applications to be written back to the X and slows down performance that way. So that's, you're saying that would be a time when you would need more memory? Okay, so repeat one more time and real, just so I can repeat it for people online. Okay, so essentially when you're running memory intensive applications um, that require a lot of memory while they're running. And since you're running a supercomputer, um, it could cause 
like applications to essentially be written back, like the data that, that they're using to that they're processing to be written back to the hard disk. And it's very costly to you know, data from the hard disk as opposed to reading from the memory. Okay. All right. So we said one, we got one reason from in the room is that it could having memory access to most more processes allows for a reduction in memory contention when you have to read and write from main memory. What are some, what are in what cases might it be or type of applications where it might be beneficial to not have as much uh, shared memory for processes? Does anyone have an example of that? Any example? One could be just doing simple, um, just reading and writing of data. You don't ne necessarily need, depending on the block size of what you're gonna transmitting. So simple operations like that don't require a large amount of massive memory to be shared. So those are the types of questions and considerations that we have to take into account when we're trying to decide on a supercomputing architecture that we wanna use. And so with these SMP architectures, these allow for us to allow for centrally better load balancing and reduce contention of resources. So with cluster architectures, what we have is we can have numerous CPUs that can do computations really fast, and they're all on, the, on different racks. And so these allow for communication to occur through shared networks. And so this can be allow for uh, complex computations and programs to uh, to divide and uh, to divide and write those computations more more quickly. Um, the idea is for to to utilize a cluster system when you have a need for a reduced um, or when you have minimal communication for your types of applications. And this could be because the interconnection is it can be extremely slow in some cluster architectures. Wait, can I ask a question quickly? What's the, what do you mean by CPUs on racks? Is that like a more specific term? Yeah, sure. So CPUs on racks is just more interconnect, just uh, not connected on the per rack, and it's a rack configuration. So you'll have multiple racks uh, within a node, and that what is what constructs the cluster architecture. Thank you. Does, does that answer or clarify? Yes, thank you. And so today our architectures are uh, kind of a, I guess, a, a, a Frankenstein configuration of various parts and components, uh, a lot of hybrid architectures, uh, many node and many core systems, GPUs, uh, quantum compute nodes that can sometimes be used. And so we have a, a architecture that's uh, really is being uh, compartmentalized to meet various supercomputing needs. So, so there's no longer a one type of system fits all approach for designing systems. And so Perlmuter, our flagship supercomputing system is one of the one of these systems that contains uh, scientific components that can that's useful for different groups. So it consists of our uh, GPU as well as CPU uh, nodes that can be utilized. We have over almost 1,800 uh, GPU accelerated nodes that can be utilized for uh, advanced scientific applications, uh, deep learning and neural network uh, modeling and machine learning. We have our CPU only nodes that can be utilized as well for more traditional uh, scientific applications and scientific simulations. Um, it's important to realize that because not all applications are going to port from a traditional CPU architecture to GPU. Sometimes that can actually degrade the performance. So you have to figure out what is going to be uh, most efficient for your architecture. Um, on a large scale, we have our uh, high-speed uh, interconnect. We use a slingshot interconnect that allows for uh, quick access on the network. We have multiple uh, storage mechanisms that are available for users to utilize. So really it's 
uh, when you think of a supercomputer, it's definitely a, a um, uh, interconnection of various components, almost like all of your computers at the lab interconnected together. And so our Perlmuter was originally um, arrived in 2021 and was achieved final acceptance in 2023. And this is just a breakdown of our over, overall architecture of each of our nodes that are available. And these will be the systems that we'll be doing our hands-on activities on today. And so what you want to consider the difference between working with a, a GPU on a system versus a CPU is going to depend on the type of applications that you're going to be using and the type of science that you're going to use in the algorithms. GPU nodes are going to be very, very useful if you need intent, immense compute powers to do uh, intense calculations in parallel that don't require a large amount of memory. So that's why they're good for um, generative tasks, uh, generative AI, as well as uh, neural network modeling and whatnot. Um, CPUs are going to be uh, more powerful in the sense that they have more memory, but they're going to be um, only about the only about a tenth of the compute power that you could get from a GPU. So some of those considerations are things that you have to take into account when you're going to decide whether you're going to use a GPU option or a CPU option. And so at, at on Perlmuter, we have various file system mechanisms for you to use our global file systems, uh, Scratch, as well as our long-term long storage as well. Now, so over the past years, NERSS has ho hosted a number of different supercomputing architectures. This is just a high-level short list of some of those architectures that were, um, that have been, uh, that have been housed here at NURSE, um, starting in from 2003 to 2006. Seaborg, uh, Seaborg was a IBM uh, SP system, uh, 375 megahertz power three processor, uh, single core, um, and Seaborg was actually the first supercomputing uh, system that I used in grad school, as well as Jacord um, from 2004 to 2007. It was a uh, Linux cluster, one of the first uh, dual core um, processor uh, supercomputers. It used Intel Xeon processors, 3.06 gigahertz, uh, 712 nodes in that system. And then later on was also BASI, which was launched as another uh, system. It was an IBM Power 5 system um, that used uh, 1.9 gigahertz Power 5 uh, processor. Other systems that nurses supported, uh, we had the Franklin system, and that is an image of Franklin shown on the slide. It was a Cray XT4 system, had over 38,000 uh, 38, AMD Optron 4s on it, um, used a Cray C-Star 2 plus network. Uh, then we had the Hopper system from 2010 to 2015. It was a Cray XE6 system had over 150,000 AMD hex core processors on it as well. And then moving on, we had our Edison system as well as Cori. Cori shown here. Edison and uh, Edison and Cray were both X were both Cray XC systems. Edison was an XC30 in the Cray, and Cori was an XC40 system. Uh, Cori was largely uh, CPU heavy, and with the migration towards Perlmuter, we introduced more GPU heavy compute tasks for our users to use. So those are some of the various systems that we've had through at NURSE throughout the years, um, different uh, architectures and different um, configurations. Um, moving forward, we want to keep in mind that supercomputing architectures are gonna be very hybrid in configuration. It'll consist of more GPUs combined with CPUs, uh, maybe quantum units, uh, different quantum networks, um, FPGAs as well. So it's going to be supercomputer architecture is more defined by what our scientific needs are versus what our capabilities of our physical components are. <coughs>